This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by Sound Porter Mastering, OWC, Atom Audio, API Audio, Jay-Z Microphones, Spectra 1964, and Isotope. In fact, you're hearing my voice right now through the Jay-Z pop filter on the Jay-Z BB-29 microphone through the Spectra 1964 STX600 mic pre complimenter and Isotope RX and Ozone, all recorded safely onto an OWC Mercury Extreme Pro 6G SSD. So get ready to rock. When it comes to music making, my thing about it is that my imprint on the music I work on needs to sort of cleanse any of those fear side energies and introduce only the good ones. Because I believe that people hear, uh, and this is, you know, may sound crazy, I understand, but I believe that people hear the qualities of the humans in the music. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. When I master a song, I'm immersed and committed to a sonic fidelity from start to beyond finished. Hi, I'm Brian Murphy of Sound Porter Mastering. My goal in every master is to help you prepare so that you're not compromising your timeline, budget, or your mix. My iterative process helps build a relationship with you so that you don't have to ever second guess your mix. Let's pull back the curtains on mastering because there's no secrets here. Send me your mix and I'll give you free feedback or a free master demo. Just hit me up at soundporter.com. Whether you're in the studio or working remotely, the Envoy Pro FX from OWC lets you record from anywhere with confidence, pushing USB technology bandwidth to the max of 2,800 megabytes per second over Thunderbolt. Transfer tracks in seconds and take your sessions with you anywhere you go. Built for the road, the OWC Envoy Pro FX is waterproof, dustproof, and crushproof. Find the new Envoy Pro FX and all your storage needs at maxsales.com slash rock. Stars. Jay-Z Mics brings you the ultimate futuristic pop filter for your studio built from solid metal parts that won't break and a flexible gooseneck for easy placement. The Jay-Z Pop Filter uses a unique waveguide design that prevents plosives from getting through to the mic while allowing important high frequencies for clarity. Plus, it looks super cool and you're hearing my voice on it right now. Use the limited time coupon ROCKSTARS to get 20% off this amazing pop filter from jayzmike.com. Hey, Rockstars, it's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Brian Lucy, a mastering engineer who began in the late 1980s in New York City, East Village, as a professional musician focusing on guitar, voice, and piano, who became a student of Robert Fripp and guitar craft through the early and mid 90s. He has many years of experience in band creativity, writing, arranging, performing, tracking, mixing, and producing organic music using tape machines, for example, like the Ampex MM1200 2-inch. And mastering began for Brian in the late 90s. His experience in all the other phases of music have led to a distinctly musical approach to his mastering. Originally, he's from the city of Columbus, Ohio, and now he works out of Los Angeles at Magic Garden Mastering Studio. Um, many of Brian's credits include artists like Lucinda Williams, Green Day, The Black Keys, Cage the Elephant, Marilyn Manson, Dr. John, The Shins, Depeche Mode, and many, many more. And also a big thank you to Brian Murphy over at soundporter.com for making our introduction. Please welcome Brian Lucy to Recording Studio Rockstars. Brian, are you ready to rock, my friend? I am as ready as I'm going to be. All right, groovy, man. Glad to have you here, dude. Thanks for taking time out for us. Sure um, thing. You know, right off the bat, I, I will say that I did listen to you do an interview with Warren Hewitt, another great channel for learning about the studio. And I really enjoyed hearing you talk about your studio and your monitors and all that. And I'm looking at your 
the, the website is a great picture. And it's just such a cool setup. It looks super cozy. And these are like these huge monitors that look like robots just sort of accompanying you on either side. Tell us a little bit about yourself and about your studio. Um, tell us about Magic Garden Mastering. Well, um, like your bio nicely said, I'm a mastering engineer out of sort of organic evolution of being a musician. I never thought I would be a mastering engineer, but it turns out it's really my thing to do. And uh, the speakers are um, jumping all the way forward. Those are new. I'm sure Warren appreciates the plug. Uh, that was four years ago. And those speakers were um, used until like two months ago. I had them up for about 14 years. And those speakers are Sonics by Joachim Gerhardt. Uh, he's a brilliant German who occasionally needs medication because he's so smart he thinks he can fly, although that doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't sound very smart. But he's a truly brilliant guy. And um, I actually was an early adopter of barefoot sound uh, when mm -hmm. Thomas was making speakers out of his uh, bedroom. And he worked at Intel as one of the slaves to making chips at Intel. And uh, this is before really there was a company. And so the speakers I had for four years before those Sonics, which are a freestanding three-way, like a hi-fi three-way, two eights on the bottom, uh, five and a half in the mid, and a nice uh, combo tweeter with paper and a titanium center, which is really right, cool. Right. So that I love that tweeter. But before that speaker for 14 years, I had the... Um, the original Barefoot MM12, I think it was the second pair Thomas ever made. And it was a front-firing 12 with two mids and a tweeter. And on the back, he strapped on a Bryston 4B SST. Oh, and, yeah. and it was someone I met online, you know. It was like in the mid-2000s. And I thought, oh, that guy's really bright. And so I sent him a check for like $7,000. And eight or nine months later, the speakers came back. And I used those for four years. So it was four years on those. It was 14 years on the Sonics. And now I have these, uh, as you said, kind of robotic monstrosities. Uh, yeah, beautiful wood uh, construction too. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, this is also like the Sonic speaker. This is in the, uh, the hi-fi world. Okay, so this company is uh, Evolution Acoustics. I'm happy to plug them. It's a small company with high quality and no compromise and low margins, which is, I appreciate both of those things. Uh, I like good value and I like high quality, no compromise. And so the designer is uh, Kevin Malgren. And he, he used to work uh, for uh, Von Schweikert and before that Eggleston works. So those are, you know, sort of hi-fi companies you might know, like Bob Ludwig has some big Eggleston works and um, Von Schweikert's been around forever. And so, he started this company with with another dude, kind of as a business partner. And this speaker has actually been around for like 15 years. It's the MM3 from Evolution Acoustics. And uh, the pair that I have here are actually the designer's personal uh, demo, like original model. So they had th they built these first, and they took them to all the trade shows and all that. So. There's a lot of love in these, and uh, and they're in a different color. Their their company color is like a red finish, and these are brown, which I kind of like. And they're a little scratch and dent after 15 years, which uh, made it even a better value for me, which I like. But it's really a, quite an interesting thing. It's a speaker I would never would have looked into, uh, but I met Kevin through a roundabout means, and he sent me an email a year and a half ago and said, "Hey." I've, I've got these speakers. They're my personal model. I think they'd be great for you. I'd love to sell them to someone who actually would appreciate them in a different way than the hi-fi people do who are their normal customers. And I was like, no, thanks. You know, I'm not interested. I'm, not, I'm never going to change from the speakers I have, you know, blah, blah, blah. And over a year later, I, I started to have the thing that you have when it's time to change, where you're annoyed with something that you're using and you don't even know it for a while, and then it starts to creep into your head like, ah, there's something wrong with the sound of this. 
you like, know, and, like every mix I'm working on. <laughs> ex- exactly. And, I, and this is kind of my litmus for anybody who's looking to change their equipment, right? You don't, you don't go on the forums or look at a picture and say, you know, uh, fear of missing out. You know, I don't have that thing. You actually have to have it bother you, right? It right. should, it should, it should bother you, right? And then you, you can A B. You can say, well, I have this thing, and it's kind of bothering me. Let me try some B options, and then you find something else, or or you don't. So anyway. That's the story. I I eventually drove down to San Diego, not two hours from here, listened to them in his untreated, uh, frankly, horrible living room, and uh, took my own amp, took my own D to A, took my own refs, and uh, I was like, okay, that's very similar sound to what I have, but gosh, do they look different. Um, It's a totally different design aesthetic, but the sound was very similar. It was just lower distortion. It was just right. a better version of what I've been used to. So I thought about it, and uh, and now here we are. And it is literally like, it's like the same thing, but better. So there wasn't like a big learning curve, you know? Uh, that's good. So let me, let me ask you a dumb question, Brian. Um, as somebody who might be looking at mastering and thinking like, you know, uh, for somebody who's listening and thinks, what does mastering do? Um you know, I've heard you talk about your speakers on on another show, and then you describe them here, and they're clearly an important part of it. But but the dumb question is, how does you having speakers help you master my record to sound better? I mean, well, like, there's nothing the speakers do to the sound, right? Well, uh, well, sure. Except you know, this the, the the nature of sound is that we have a speaker, and then we have a room, and then we have a listener. <clears throat> so. All three of those things matter. And, you know, in a mixing context, context the uh, the rooms are often, you know, compromised. There's a bunch of stuff in there. And the speakers, you know, don't have to do what a mastering speaker needs to do. Um, I mean, sure, you can you can master on a on a lesser speaker, um, but it just gets easier and easier and easier because you hear more and more and you hear it more accurately. Mm-hmm. And you know, there's there's a lot of answers I could give to what is mastering, but the most basic answer that anyone would say is it's about translation in the world. So, translation in the world is uh, is a much easier thing to accomplish if your room and your speakers and your person are in a high place. Okay, yeah. And then um, when I look at the picture of these new speakers, the tweeters are kind of in the center. Is it important to set up monitoring so that the tweeters are at ear level? Is that a, a critical part of it or not necessarily? Well, it's 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 important to set up monitoring so that it's the best it can be given the compromises of your room. So right, right. like if it, if a tweeter is at ear level, it's directed directly at your ear, that's the brightest it's going to be. Mm-hmm. If it's uh, aimed past you a couple feet, then it's a little different presentation. You normally wouldn't aim the tweeter point in front of you. So it's going to be either at your head or behind your head. And then there's a lot of other factors. There's what is your ear height to the speaker? As you go up and down on a speaker, you get a different response. So there's where is the speaker in the room? As you get closer to the sidewall, the back wall, which is the corner, you get a different low end response. And where's the speaker left and right in the room? It's important in mastering, hugely important, but even in mixing, it's important to get the width right so that when you pan something wide, it's actually wide as opposed to um, you think it's wide, but it's not, or it's so wide that the middle of the mix disappears. Right. So the the, the, the setup of the speaker left right in the room, the, the, the spacing and all of that is a whole other kind of very subtle art form we could get into, but that's that's hugely important for me because I'm doing a lot of times some uh, very subtle mid-side EQ things. So I don't want to butcher what comes in. I want to enhance it. But knowing how to get the power right between the center, uh, a.k.a. the mid, and the outside, a.k.a. the sides, getting that power balance right is is very important. So there's the left-right component in the room, as well as all those other frequency balancing components. So I know that for those of us who are um, at the stage of, you know, writing the song and creating the music, um, doing mixing in a home studio, for example, it might be very common to have the computer screen be front center. But uh, one of the things that's cool looking at your uh, 
the photo of your studio is, you know, you've got the, you don't, you don't have a computer front center. You've got them uh, off to the sides so that you can do what you need, but you've got a bunch of other things. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about some of the tools that you like to have in front of you while you're mastering and why they matter? Yeah. So, I mean, ideally you wouldn't have anything in front of you because you're trying to really open up the room. And so in my case, um, I'm using a PC to my right running Sequoia software. And on my left is a Mac for email and et cetera. And, you know, they're angled in such a way to kind of stay out of the reflections of the room. And in front of me is your basic two rack mastering desk. It's your basic uh, Sterling modular thing. And I mean, ideal, ideal, ideally, you wouldn't even have that, you know. Uh, but what's in front of me is uh, the analog sweetening hardware, which is crucial. Uh, I've had this stuff for all of my years, really. Uh, it took me a few years in the early 2000s to get it, but kind of like, you know, being a guitar player and putting together foot pedals and cables and amps and tubes and speakers, there's there's kind of a sound you're going for, you know. Um, maybe that target changes over time, but for me, there was... There was kind of a singular target that I heard in my head back in the day. Um, you know, I thought Bob Ludwig did some cool stuff occasionally. I thought Ted Jensen did some cool things occasionally. Um, I wasn't too into what anyone else was doing. Um, and I definitely wasn't into what I could pay for in the late 90s at 100 bucks a song, you know, mm -hmm. which kind of where it was. That was the low end. And um, so. I kind of had this this sort of target sound in my mind, and it took some time to get to it. And it, you know, there was a period where I'd listen to every damn thing that was possibly available on the market. You know, I'd, and I'd combine them like foot pedals. You know, I just they were three and five thousand dollar foot pedals, but that's what credit cards are for. And <laughs> I would just try things, combine, 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 and eventually I came up with the chain that I have, which really with one addition recently is the same chain for all the records in all the years and um so if you want to, i mean if you're asking for kind of the layout i can give you the i can give you the sort of the path it's pretty short sure sure and i don't know if it follows um you know if there's basic building blocks of what goes into a mastering chain or if it's you know to describe it however you want we're, we're just we love to hear well i mean you know it's my opinion of course i i think I think if you're going to have basic building blocks of a mastering chain, you want to have a couple of EQs, a clean one, a color one. Uh, you want to have a couple of compressors, maybe a, you know, like in my case, I have a um, kind of a really clean, like like super clean SSL style, which is the Elysia Alpha. Mm -hmm. I have actually serial number one of that, the first Alpha they ever made. And that's like a really clean... Um, kind of in the SSL vein, but it's kind of way, 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 way cleaner and more musical to me. They didn't call it the Alpha Alpha? <laughs> no, I have the Alpha Alpha, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and then you like to have maybe a different kind of compression. Maybe you have a very Muse style, or in my case, I have a, a FET style. Um, so a couple EQs, a couple compressors, and then some limiting. And, and that's it. You know, the, the rest is speakers, room, and, and skill. Uh, the the tools are um, the tools are about the color palette and the quality and the way that the tools relate to the ear of the driver because you know everyone who's mastering has a flavor even the people who say I don't have a flavor eh, then that's your flavor right so there's a there's a stamp that you put on it so when the tools resonate with kind of what your mindset is or what you hear in your head is musical, then that just makes everything flow better. So every every mastering engineer at the high end uh, would have its own room sound. You know, a lot of them very different from each other, would have their own chain. But in generic terms, I think, you know, a couple of EQs, a couple compressors, some limiter or limiters, and, uh, and that's it. 
Spectra. Okay, cool. Thanks. The Spectra 1964 BBDI Passive Direct Box is perfect for recording deep bass that will make your mixes sound huge. Plug that into a C610 comp limiter, and as founder Bill Cheney points out, it'll move your pant leg. But what if you want to record direct keyboards? Spectra 1964 now offers the Stereo BBDI 2 with custom wound high Z transformers for big headroom, virtually flat response, and a 15 dB input pad at spectra1964.com. You may already know that Isotope creates the very best smart plugins for mixing and mastering. But did you know that now you can get them all through Isotope's new affordable subscription bundles? Get Music Production Suite Pro for only $24.99 per month or Producers Club for only $19.99 per month. Start your seven-day free trial subscription now or go to isotope.com slash rockstars and use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off any individual plugin purchase. Coupon not valid for subscriptions or Spire Studio. If we were to ask you basically what is mastering, how would how would you go about answering that question right now? Well, um, I mean, my answer, the deep answer is very different than the sort of straight answer. Uh, I can do both if you'd like. <laughs> I, got, the, I got a long list of questions in front of me too, so do whichever okay. one feels right to you. All right, I'll try and be quick. So the straight answer I kind of touched on, you know, mastering is about translation in the world. And it's, it, you know, the mastering engineer is the final step to address things. Now, some people would say fix things. I don't like that language. I look at mastering as enhancement. Mm -hmm. And in, 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 in the deeper sense, I look at it as musicality enhancement. And then I look at it as connection. I look at it as intimacy. I look at it as community, and I look at it as elevation. So what do I mean by that? I mean, connection in, is <clears throat> partly the translation piece. Intimacy is really thinking about music that, that each song or each, each, each moment of each song is really meant to touch one person, right? So that word, that phrase, that song, you know, we don't write for 10 million people. We write for one person to feel it. Hmm. So to me, mastering is enhancing that intimate language, which is music. And so you, you know, you can look at mastering like a science project, which is the opposite of how I see it, where you're just dealing with the lows, the mids, the highs, the low mids, the high mids, and kind of balancing and making things neutral. I, I don't work that way. To me, that's kind of missing out on the potential power of the step as a... Yeah as an enhancement step to all of the great work that's gone into it. Or, or you could, you know, pay for a robot for 20 bucks. Well, where, where I, I, don't wanna, I don't want to interrupt, but I want to reinforce what you're saying. I, I've certainly experienced that thing where you do a mix and you're hoping that mastering will bring out the thing that you were trying so hard to bring out and maybe felt like you didn't quite get all the way there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, so, yeah, so... So it's an enhancement thing along the lines of what I was saying, where there's the intimacy thing, then there's the, the connection thing where, you know, if, if you love an artist and someone else loves an artist, well, now we have community, right? So music is like a community building experience, but it starts with one person at a time. And then ultimately the elevation piece, which is like, it should make you feel something. You should feel better when you listen to it than when you didn't, right? This sounds a little yeah. obvious. It sounds obvious, but... Whether it's death metal and a murder ballad or, a, you know, or happy, you know, like the, like the happiest pop songs of all time, uh, happy or don't worry, be happy. It, it doesn't matter. Uh, elevation of the human is the thing. So we start with the relationship to one listener. We build community, et cetera. So what does that have to do with mastering? Well, if that's my intention to enhance and to and to take music to that point, that's a very different intention than if you're looking at it like a science project, mm -hmm. or if you're looking at it like fixing, or if you're looking at it like uh, making the levels louder and making everything equal, right? So, intentions matter in life, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's 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 how I look at mastering. Those are my intentions. It's to it's to really connect to the core audience, to to open up to the broadest possible audience for that artist. Uh, which is, you know, not for me or anyone to say, but you're kind of, you're, you're trying to, you know, and, and, you're, and you have to keep each project in mind. You know, maybe I do a single of an unknown person. 
Maybe I do a follow-up record to a multi-million selling thing. It's a very, it's a different moment, but you're still looking for the same things, musicality things. And, and although music is very subjective, I believe, and I've always believed, and so I'm going to kind of say that it, there must be something to what I believe because uh, it, it, it works. I've always believed there's objective things that people like about music. Like people like woofers that move air and groove, you know, mm -hmm. people dance. They like to feel it. Yeah. Again, style doesn't matter. People like um, a certain harmonic and, and frequency content per style. Like some things are brighter, cleaner, some things are fatter and more distorted, and that relates to style. And there's kind of a cocktail there, which is part of our expectation based on, you know, sort of the recorded history of music, you know. And then people like to hear a vocal, but they don't want to strain for it. That's annoying. And they don't want it to be overwhelming. So there's like a sweet spot on vocals. So, you know, there's a longer list there, but I think there are objective things about music that I apply every day to every project and every style. You know, and I have hundreds of clients a year and, and some are new and some are huge and they're every style. So, you know, I, I sort of apply the same principles of what I consider sort of a objective musicality in all cases. And then, of course, you know, if somebody doesn't like it, you know, you tweak it. But but you're, you're, you're going for something more than a lot of people's answer to what is mastering would be more of like a science project answer. Mm -hmm. No, I love your answer. I think it's great. And um I think listening to your discography and a reminder, rock stars, we have that in the show notes. We put together a Spotify playlist. You can go listen to a whole bunch of these great records that Brian's mastering. Um, it, to me, it's really clear that there's a theme of, um, or at least maybe because of the styles that appeal to me, but I, I like hearing the power of a rock band playing together. I like hearing um, and feeling the dr the impact of the drums, you know, in, in different styles and stuff. And one of the artists you worked with is Marilyn Manson, The Pale Emperor. Um, and that one, I think of that when you talk about, you know, the different uh, tonalities that are in the context appropriate for each record. That Marilyn Manson's records in that one have a, a distinct kind of, I don't know, uh, I, don't want, I don't want to say bright like it's really bright, but there's a, there's a bright crunch to the drums and the guitars that makes perfect sense. Um, that might be different from other records. Uh, what was your process uh, mastering that record? Are there any stories you want to share about uh, working on that one and working with Marilyn Manson? Well, hmm, let me think. I mean, I, I am fond of that record. Not that I'm not fond of any of them, but, you know, I, I sort of, I'm sort of in love with whatever I'm doing in the moment. And then if I find myself listening to it months or years later, then I say, okay, well, I'm, I must like that one as a person, not just as a service provider. Right. Um, but yeah, so I, I kind of like that one as a person. I think the opening track, just from the moment that that groove comes in, it immediately captures, you know, what I think is important about mastering, which is like the first impression and the and the bringing you bringing you close to the artist. I mean that 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 groove is an undeniable groove, and I'm immediately hooked. And and when I played it for people before it came out, you know, a friend would come by or family or what have you, and I'd say, check this. And they, I'd play 10 seconds. And they would say, that's Marilyn Manson? Really? And I said, yeah, it is. And they're like, I want to hear that. You know, so, so that, that's, a, that's what mastering is about on one level. You know, I look at it as, going back to your question, it's, it's a balance between first impressions and then timelessness you know, timeless quality. So you want it to hit you over the head the right way, but you also want to listen to it 5, 10, 20 years from now and be really happy with it. Okay, so, and I'll interject. Uh, Rock says, I believe the first opening track is Killing Strangers, if I'm, if, that's, if I'm seeing it in the right order in Spotify right now. Yeah, I'm bad with names, but that sounds right. Yeah, I was just I was just helping you out with that. I think, I think that I might think, be it. I think it is, yeah. Names uh, sound my thing, not... <laughs> Not names of sounds. I would but, never. I would never ask you to remember all the names of the songs and the records. No, I can't remember my own name. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, or my my girlfriend's walks all these dogs. I can't keep them straight. But um, yeah, so Killing Strangers, incredible groove, and uh, that was that was Tyler Bates. It's a very interesting record. I mean, 
it's an anecdotal uh, from talking with Tyler, the producer, who's done a lot of TV uh, and mostly big film stuff. Um, maybe not TV, I'm not sure, but he's a film a film guy. So somehow he had met Manson and they struck up a rapport and they kind of just sat down, the two of them, every day. And, and he kind of produced that in the box in his studio with his keyboard, his drum machine, what, you know, whatever he had nearby. And he has, he has a really nice home studio. You know, he's, he's, he's been successful doing, uh, soundtrack things. And, you know, it was a very, like, it was a very good process of just the two of them. And then Manson would come in with a lyrical idea and they'd work on it. And then it evolved from being an in the box thing to actually having real players play the parts and so it, it it sonically turned into something that sounds very live, mm -hmm. uh, but it was actually put together very piece by piece, just with the producer of great skill in and and, and a rock background. I think. I mean, I, I don't know Tyler intimately well, but I think he said he was in bands and you know he obviously could play guitar and that sort of thing. So that's just a cool record from the way it was built to the way it evolved with real players to you know when it came to me and it's again it's. It's the job of the day when I get it, you know. I mean, I don't, I don't actually judge things, you know. I don't think, oh, this is going to be big, or oh, this, this, you know, I don't care about this one, or this mix sucks, you know. I don't let myself go there. I think that's not professional, and that's not part of my. Uh, I guess you'd call it sort of my meditation, you know. My 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 thing is that every day is the same. Every project is the same. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I got it. I was like, okay, well, this is cool. And then just enhanced, you know, because if something comes in at a very high level, I still have to take it to a higher level. If something comes in at a very modest quality or, you know, lower quality, I can take it up quite a bit pretty easily, but you still have to take things that come in at a higher level. You have to take them up. That's what mm -hmm. you're getting for. You're, you're, you're getting paid to enhance uh, oftentimes things that are really good, you know, and that was the thing that was really good. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a, that's a cool record. And, uh, I appreciate you bringing that one up. Sure. I'm, I've, I've been a Marilyn Manson fan for a long time. Years ago, one of the first bands I produced, they introduced me to Marilyn Manson. And, and so I listened to those records and really grew to appreciate them. Um, and we've had Michael Beinhorn on the show a couple of times and enjoyed talking to him about working with him as well. Um, so let's see here when you're talking about taking mixes and, and sort of uplifting them in the mastering process. Do you, like how, how often might mastering be a series of bold moves as opposed to subtle moves? Well, that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, that's kind of what separates really skilled people from the rest. Like if you, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an in-the-moment thing, right? So something might need subtle things, but if you do 50 subtle things, it sounds quite bold. Or something might just need two bold things, and then you lay out because that's what it's going to be. So in my experience, the the mixes that are, let's say, the lesser, you know, I don't, there's no such thing as a perfect mix. Let me say very clearly, it's important. There's no perfection in music, right? So there's no perfect mix, but you do, nice. you do, you do hear things. You say, okay, that's really well done. You hear other things. You're like, well, that's not as well done, right? And we we know what that sounds like. Um, so something that's not as well done is usually going to be bolder moves on my end, and not too many, just enough to kind of get it where it can go. Something that's really well done, and this is a very very strange and huge misconception that I read on the internet or I've hear, heard people say over the years in interviews. This concept that if, if the mixes are better, then the mastering is easier. Complete and total bullshit. Absolutely <laughs> not true. It's the opposite of that. If the mixes are better, if the production is better, if there's a bunch of really skilled people who hand you something amazing, uh, the mastering is harder. Because from my standpoint, I'm looking for a musicality upgrade. I'm not looking to to be hands off at any time. I don't. I don't think you can be hands off. I think if that's your intention, then that comes across energetically to the listener. Uh, it sort of makes it again into a science project. It turns it into like a perfectionism thing. It's it's not it's not a musical choice. So 
So if, if something comes in really good, then you might do a, you might listen to it and say, wow, this is great. I, you know, I, and I've had this experience. I'm like, oh, there's nothing I can do here. Maybe this will be the first time that I never touch a record. <laughs> And I might sit with that for a, a period of time, right? I mean, it could be a 10 seconds. It could be 10 minutes. I could come back to it the next day. But inevitably, you listen to something longer, and you're like, oh, well, actually, what if we did this? And then you do a little thing. So, and what if we did this? And then, and and always a being with the source, always volume adjusting with the, with the mix. And so really great productions usually get some little tweaks, or a lot of little tweaks, but they're not going to get a big tweak. At the other end of the spectrum, it's going to get some big tweaks. Not a little, not a lot of little ones. You know, again, we're being very hypothetical here. Probably not a lot of little ones, but it might be a couple big ones and a little siblings thing or a little where that kick drum's weird or whatever. Because the the, the the ceiling, and I don't mean to use that in the limiting sense, but the the quality ceiling for the lower quality mix is actually lower than the higher quality mix, but it's a lot higher than most people think. Like I, I, I started doing nothing but shitty mixes. So I, I worked for myself and my friends for free. And, you know, my mixes were okay. I'm an okay mixer. I got, you know, I got better over time. I worked for my friends. They were okay, but they weren't like world-class mixers. And so, you know, I, I started off doing mixes that weren't that great so i've got a lot of practice with that and then as i got as i got into getting better and better quality stuff and now i have a lot of practice with that as well so i'm i'm sort of happy to do either one you know to me the ceiling of a lower quality production is actually a lot higher than most people think mm -hmm. and the ceiling of a high quality production is actually a little bit higher than most people would think so now would, so are think, you doing mixing as well these days oh no i haven't mixed a record for uh like gosh 15 years or something okay all right no i i master full-time every day i'm fortunately very busy i'm uh i work i work every day well so when you when you were talking about um you know sitting with it for a while it reminded me of your comment of the gear it's like it's almost like you got to sit with the music until something bothers you and and then it maybe sparks a move to uh to you know do to to do something and i understand how you know when people bring music to you they're hoping that you'll do something and and when you look at it you're probably looking at it and thinking i'm ready to do something with this well i mean yeah i mean obviously it's always from a standpoint of service and respect it's always from a standpoint of of enhancement like there's it's not like an ego thing of like I'm gonna put my stamp on this, you know. No, no, no. But it, but it, but it's like, um, yeah, you. I mean, what I thought of when you when you when you mentioned that isn't really what you're asking, but it's it's how I'm gonna respond. Sure. So I I, I think of listening as kind of a whole body experience. So, you know. I, I used to meditate every day. I don't for a long time, but I used to meditate like a little bit every day. And, and I'm, it's, it's been a long time ago, but I got into this idea long, long time ago of the sort of vibrational quality of sound, you know, like singing bowls and all those healing drums. And I did a, a lot of that stuff like 20 some years ago. And so I listen sort of vibrationally to the whole sound as opposed to listening with my head, for example, or listening with fear, which can be, you know, a, a different way of listening. I sort of just sort of try to empty myself out and let the thing come through me and then just kind of say, okay, well, what's going on here, you know? Yeah. And, and then if I move to do something, I do it. You know, if I'm not, I, I don't do it. And again, you're always a being because you want to be respectful at all times. Mastering is a service job, 100%, 100%. 100%. So... Yeah, so that that's kind of my thing. I just sort of uh, make sure I'm in the right place to work. I sit down, let the thing hit me, and then let myself respond organically to what you know what seems to be the way to go. And um, and and you know that's maybe that's how everyone does it, and uh, I don't know, but that's how it works for me. That's cool. Um, well, I love that that idea of. Um, 
discouraging people from making decisions in, from fear because it's it's so true. There's there's a lot of stuff we probably do in songwriting, production, mixing, editing, mastering decisions that that are coming from fear, and we might not even realize it. Um, yeah, this, this it, well, it's actually one of my favorite topics. If you don't, if you don't mind, no, not at all. Go for it. So, I, yeah, so I have a lot of kind of worldview beliefs. I've given you a couple. Um, another one is that love and fear are the two motivations for everything at all times in the world: music, politics, relationships, you name it. Yeah. So you know. We're, we're these very mental people, particularly in the information age. You know, we're very smart. We have lots of concepts. But if you really look at a lot of those concepts in action, and I could give examples, but I don't think we have to, you, you see that what comes behind them is either something I'd put in the category under love, which would be kindness, generosity, patience, compassion, humility, etc., or something that comes under fear, which would be power, greed, exploitation, you know, etc. So... When it comes to music making, um, my thing about it is that my imprint on the music I work on needs to sort of cleanse any of those fear side energies and introduce only the good ones. Um, <clears throat> because I believe that people hear, uh, and this is, you know, may sound crazy. I understand. But I believe that people hear the qualities of the humans in the music. So let me explain. Like the person that brings Adele's coffee obviously isn't on the record. But if the person that brings Adele's coffee when she's having a bad day uh, makes Adele happy in that moment, then Adele's performance is better. And then we hear that for the rest of time. Yeah. If if the mixer has a certain energy different than another mixer, that's why we hire that person. So to me, the music making process is an energetic transfer trade process because music is ultimately just energy waves in space and time. Like it's 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 timed out. There's frequencies. This is all like the language of vibration. So if music is this this universal language of vibration. Then the people involved, obviously, you know, they, they all contribute in their own way. So it's this it's this chain of things. So if there's fear in there, and fear is a, like a very common human thing, I do it, you do it, we all do it. If there's fear in the production, I believe the audience doesn't want to hear that. Yep. It's like it's like <clears throat> not to name names, but there's there's mastering out there that that does what I call trying too hard. Like trying too hard in music is where you're 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 turning the music into like a, a bright and shiny orange billboard on 42nd Street. Like, <laughs> look at me. I'm a song. You want to hear me. You know, pay attention to me. To me, that's insecure. I, I think that music should present itself like uh, like the hot girl at the bar. Right. So the hot girl at the bar does what? What does the hot girl at a bar do? Ignore you. <laughs> she, exactly she doesn't it's just she doesn't do anything she just sits or stands there and waits right hot girl at the bar is attractive right so i believe music needs to be attractive so my presentation of sounds and you know the, the transient balance the frequency balance the distortion balance the midside power balance which are kind of the four players that i'm playing with those things should present a music which is sort of magnetic it's sort of attractive it it it's sort of half the circle right like two speakers makes a crescent two ears makes a crescent i'm trying to get people to come to the music i'm not trying to put the music down your throat i think people are pretty tired of that we live yeah. in a commercial world full of advertisements and and so to me that's the insecurity sound or the insecurity energy that, that can be in a mix or can be in, in, in mastering, frankly. So my, my thing is not that. My thing is to be confident and to present a music which is alluring and magnetic and attractive because it's confident. Because I think that's what people want. I think everybody wants to be fearless and confident. So we look to our artists for that fearless and confidence even if it's all fabricated, right? Even if like if the artist is the most insecure person ever in real life, 
the music they make, we we want it to to elevate us by by having that kind of stature. So, you know, that's 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 a long way around the question, but that's how I look at it. That's great. If you're ready to upgrade your studio to the famous sound of API's large format consoles, then you're ready for The Box, a small format console featuring the same analog circuitry and original 2520 op amp design that has made API famous for 50 years. Record through eight world-class mic pre-channels, mix through 24 smooth-as-glass faders, and upgrade your home studio to legendary status. API now offers a virtual console experience, allowing you to get a personalized online demo of the box at apiaudio.com. Adam Audio can provide all your monitor needs, whether you are setting up a first-time home studio for recording music or podcasts, or a world-class studio for professional mixing and mastering. Their unique accelerated ribbon tweeter design is famous for creating smooth, detailed imaging that let your speakers disappear into your music, allowing you to focus on the mix. Learn how to set up your studio monitors and control room for great sound, plus lots of other cool studio tips at adam-audio.com slash education. Um, well, let me jump to this because uh, I love the idea of love and you know removal of the fear. And that kind of answered the question I was going to ask about what advice you might have for people staying busy with, uh, with recording music right now uh, is probably just focus on the love. Um, but what, one of the artists you work with is, has been Dan Auerbach in the Black Keys. You've done a number of records with those guys. Um, what do you love about working with them? Well, I haven't worked with them for a while. Uh, they've they've moved on, but um, when we were working together, we did three records for the Black Keys. I did a uh, Dr. John and uh, Cage the Elephant for Dan. Those were Grammy winners. Um, I did Sheep Dogs for Patrick and Tennis for Patrick. Patrick's a great mixer. He doesn't get enough credit. Uh, somehow, Dan who also does a great job with producing, got to be sort of the engineer world famous guy of the two. But I mean, Patrick did their first records. And and when he sent me the tennis record, I think this was in like 2011 or 12 or something, that that might have been the best mixes I'd heard all year. That's and great. I told I told him so, and he, he, he couldn't believe it. <laughs> I said, no, these are great, you know. Um, so they're both very skilled. You know, and, uh, you know, when we were working together, it was a particular era for them. It was a beautiful era. Right. So they had kind of done everything right. They had toured uh, a lot. They had done some indie label connections. Um, They had at one point eschewed taking any money for licensing, which, you know, why was that a good idea? Well, I'm a little older. So in my era, you know, you didn't that was cheesy, right? Today, that's how people want to make money. But back in the day, if you will, taking money for licensing, like that just wasn't cool. And they had that kind of old school mindset and they turned down some licensing money. And what that did for them was it, it set up a a desire for people to, to license them even more, right? It's like, it's, again, it's the hot girl at the bar. She says no, and you want her more. Right, you're like, well, damn, what do I have to do? So, by the time that the Brothers record came around, which was my first record with with the band, after I'd worked with Dan on uh, Hacienda and Jessica Lee Mayfield and um, maybe something else, I forget. But you know, that's that that record comes in. Uh, Chad Blake mixing. I never worked with Chad, and I've worked with them a bunch of times. So that was a, a lovely introduction. Very cool. And, a, and an amazing record. And I heard it and I was like, oh, this is a timeless classic. Like, boom, like right away. Um, and so at that time, they had they had worked so hard. They'd build up, you know, they were at 5,000 seat venues all over the world. And then they did Brothers and um, they brought in a producer, which is a Danger Mouse, which they hadn't worked with before. And they actually had a couple singles, like on purpose, which... Maybe they had tried before, but it, it didn't go over nearly as well. Now, was that and, like Ten Cent Pistol? Is that that time? Um, well, or Tencent, am, I, am I putting yeah, you on the spot with names again? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Ten Cent Pistol is on that record, but the 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 songs there were Howlin' for You, and um, that that was 
you know, that was big and tighten up. Right. Those were the two uh, huge singles. And, and so the, as I, as I think I've heard the story, if I recall, it's been a few years now, but like the label, which was Warner, they, they had a list of people who wanted to license the black keys that they'd turned down. So when the door was open to that, after the, the, after uh, Patrick and Dan had put their toe in the water with, um, I think uh, I'll be your man, which was on HBO's Hung. Th- you know, they they suddenly saw that oh, it's actually people. More people come to our shows when we do this. So they had put their toe in the water with licensing very late, and then for Brothers, they were like, okay, fine. So they let the label do their thing, and it was this great combination of energies where the band was in a great place organically. They had toured and worked hard and evolved their craft. Um, and Patrick was coming out of a relationship thing that was a shit show. Uh, Dan was strong. They were close. They were, uh, they were, they were creating, you know, partly with a little bit of the, of that kind of drama, which can help. And then they had a, a situation with a label where they had turned down licensing for a long time. And then just the, the state of the world, like the, if you remember, we had a recession mm-hmm. and, uh, we had a, we had a, uh, derivatives bubble that popped and we almost had a depression. And so we're in that 2010 era which at the time, if you recall, was a very kind of um, there was kind of like a heartfelt pro-America feeling at the time. It was it was after 9/11, then it was after that economic downturn. And so, the style of music that they do, again, just resonated with the moment in culture. It was very it was very like uh, apropos to that moment, you yeah. know. And, and there's been soul and blues music forever, but here they were. With their crowd, with their development, with their hard work for 10 years, with their now taking on the licensing, with the state of, of America, the state of, of, of things. And those are the things that happen when when things blow up. It all comes together, you know. Yeah, and it sounds like, you know, your background in music as a musician, and I think, I think you had said that you came from kind of a blues-focused background as well, that a lot of this appreciation for that, that whole story of how it comes together probably stems back to that for you as well. Well, yeah, and like, and uh, I mean, as a musician, you know, I was never particularly interested in being popular. That wasn't like a big goal. I was sort of on a tone quest, which obviously led to mastering because it's a tone game. But, um, you know, in everyone wants to be popular, so even in trying to be popular, you end up analyzing like what makes things popular. And there's a there's always this confluence of energies, and so they had this great combination of energies. And they'd made really, you know, like high integrity choices. And then there was this great record. So, yeah, so that that led to the Brothers thing. And I, I think I told Dan when I was doing it, I said, this is a Grammy winning record. And at the time, I was pretty salty about the Grammys. I, I might still be if I was to be <laughs> honest. But um, but it just seemed like it had that kind of that kind of uh, thing to it, you know. Well, and I- it was great to work with them. And then we did El Camino, which was a, you know, a follow up and. And we had discussions about that because, you know, you don't, you don't, not many people get a huge international breakthrough ever. And then you have the follow the record, right? You got to do Van right. Halen too, right? And if, and if, and if the follow up record is a winner, then your career is set. You're in, right? If the follow up record isn't quite so cool, then you were like a one hit wonder, you know? <laughs> oh, so it, it was important to me. Um, without going into details of it, but there was it was important to me at the time to to make sure that El Camino was 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 great in in terms of uh, my end and contributions that I that I made in terms of feedback that I, not, I will skip. But um, that's great to, to help to, to 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 cement that kind of two record legacy for them. That's cool. It's sort of the ultimate uh, mastering feedback chain. Um, so let me ask you this uh, before um, we move on to some questions, um, some outside questions. Um, another artist you work with, Lucinda Williams, a question I wanted to ask about that is, you know, one of the things I noticed is just a great quality to her vocals, uh, her voice. Um, there's a there's like a just right edge to it that's probably inherently in her voice, but it's also in the way it's recorded and the way it's mixed and mastered. And I wondered if you wanted to talk about how you can enhance the voice in mastering and, uh, you know, what sort of things you think about with regards to that? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great question and a great example. I mean, 
going back to the energy thing, like Lucinda's energy just comes across in every word and every tone of her voice, right? So you listen to Lucinda, you you get the whole woman, you know. She's a she's a really amazing person and she is authentic to the core, high integrity, loving person who really understands and and really empathizes and and that comes through in her voice. Mm-hmm. You feel the truth, right? No, she's and, not phoning it in. No, not even close. <laughs> and and songwriting, you know, as a specific subgenre versus you know, soul rock or pop rock or, you know, whatever, electronic music. Songwriting driven music is all about the story. And it's all about the storyteller and the authenticity of both, you know. And and she just excels at at both the story uh, telling and the authenticity and the voice and the whole thing. So with her, but this applies to everyone because I'm all about the voice. I mean, uh, after after the rhythm of the tune, after the groove of the thing, after the feeling of the groove, really second second to me is the voice. Yeah, it's, it's like, I, it's, I should give a shout out to um, you. Also, did the greatest showman with Hugh Jackman. It's a pretty amazing collection of voices there as well. Yeah, that was a whole different thing. <laughs> That's a totally different thing. That's like, uh, you know, like musical theater greatest hits. You know, I I hadn't seen the movie. So I was just like, uh, I did that with uh, a great producer, Greg Wells. And I was like, uh, what what do we have here? You know, because I didn't see the movie. And so these songs are all out of context, you know. But um, the funny thing about that story, I'll hit it real quick and we'll go back to Lucindo, is I'm working on that for Greg. I respect the hell out of Greg's work. And hadn't worked for him before i was recommended to to work with him uh, uh by spike stent who i'd worked with on nice. uh, a couple things before and and so um i'm doing this thing and i'm like okay musical theater all right i'm i'm doing my sort of non-judgmental song of the day thing you know and i do it and i'm like okay and so i have a i have a pricing scale like i have a international artist scale and then i discount down and I was, you know, I was thinking, well, you know, I don't really know who these artists are. I don't know what this project is. It's just some musical theater sort of pop thing. Uh, Greg usually works with huge artists, but I, you know, I wasn't really sure how to price it. And then I went to, I went to make the the DDP, the CD master, and I'm typing out the artist names. And I think the first one was Hugh Jack Man. I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> what the fuck? And then it was uh, Zach F Ron. You know, and so by the time I'd made the DDP, I said, okay, well, this is a top line, top line billing. Um, And then like within a week, maybe within less than a week of, of submitting, you know, I was approved, I submitted an invoice, et cetera. I start getting uh, my Amazon because of course, you know, I'm using Amazon like everyone. There's no other way. I just wish Bezos wouldn't take his money to Mars, but that's a different story. (laughs) So, you know, I get these Amazon boxes that have the greatest showman soundtrack in multicolors stamped on the cardboard. And I thought, okay, well, good thing I build that top line. Uh, that was definitely a, a really interesting record. And it didn't start out with much. And then it just, over a couple months after the movie came out, it just grew and grew and grew. And it just blew up internationally. And it's yeah. a beautiful thing. I went and saw the movie and I was like, oh, I get it, right? I get, this is great, right? You know. And people, some people pan the movie. They don't like this or that. I, you know, I no, maybe it's great. It was great. maybe it's my uh, you know white male from the Midwest thing. I, I like the fantasy story of like helping out the crazy people to give them a job, and you know, I, I don't like the circus hurting animals and all that real life stuff. But I just thought the movie was was really fun and really great, and had a good vibe and a good spirit to it. And uh, yeah, I was happy to happy to work on that one. <laughs> Isotope is a secret weapon for your studio that can help you get consistently pro-sounding mixes. And now you can get access to all their plugins through the new subscription options. Only $24.99 per month, Music Production Suite Pro is designed for the serious recording, mixing, and mastering engineer, putting the finishing touches on music, film, and podcasts with fully pro versions of Ozone, RX, Neutron, Nectar, Neoverb, Tonal Balance Control, Visual Mixer, and much more, including free plugin updates. 
rates. Or for only $19.99 per month, you can join Producers Club to get a suite of industry-leading production, mixing, and mastering plugins, custom presets, royalty-free samples, production courses, and more. Start your seven-day free trial subscription now or go to isotope.com slash rockstars and use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off any individual plugin purchase. Coupon not valid for subscriptions or Spire Studio. The Spectra 1964 Custom Shop now offers the STX100D, the big brother to the now famous STX100, a fully discrete mic pre with dual transformer isolated Spectra 101 amplifiers. The STX100D is exactly the same original circuit found in Stax, Arden, AdVision, AM, and Record Plant recording consoles. The sonic performance is identical. Best of all, it will plug into a single space of your standard 500 lunchbox. And if you want to add the sound of the famous Spectra C610 comp limiter, then check out the new STX600 modules, combining the STX100 mic pre and C610 in a single 500 module. That's how you're hearing my voice. Now you can get that same incredible sound in your studio that worked for famous producers like Tom Dowd with the STX mic pre's, BBDI, and comp limiters. Go to Spectra1964.com or call 801-797-0642. Whether you're in the studio or working remotely, the Envoy Pro FX from OWC lets you record from anywhere with confidence. It pushes USB technology bandwidth to the max of 2,800 megabytes per second over Thunderbolt, giving you high-speed audio data and recording and playback. Transfer tracks in seconds and take your sessions with you anywhere you go. Built for the road, the OWC Envoy Pro FX is waterproof, dustproof, and crushproof. Creativity without limits only from OWC. Imagine never having to worry about your external drive interface again or compatibility from studio to studio. Find the new Envoy Pro FX and all your storage needs at maxsales.com slash rockstars. Hey, Rockstars, we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Brian Lucy joining us on Recording Studio Rockstars. We're going to continue on, and I believe I rudely cut you off as you were just about to talk about uh share more stories about working with lucinda yeah no not not rude at all <laughs> uh yeah so lucinda and, and you're asking about voices you're asking about lucinda's voice and, and really that's all voices so the thing about the voice is it is the most intimate instrument it is the most unique instrument everybody's voice is different um i mean sure every trumpet is different but they're a lot closer than every voice um, so what's really important to me about Lucinda's voice is really the same as Manson or <clears throat> Dan Auerbach's or anyone else you want to mention, which is that, that it, that it, the, the voice should float in the center of the image in my room. It should feel like the person is there and that I can see down the back of their throat. Nice. Like I, I, I want to see the tonsils. And the shit behind the tonsils. And the, the way you get there is by clearing out space if needed and, and or maybe taking down some frequencies if needed to get it to be natural, to get it to sort of sit in a balance between what I call loud enough to ignore and like ice cream cone. So ice cream cone is like the vocal you can't ignore. And loud enough to ignore is the vocal that's just above the sound of the right, music. Right. Because you don't want to be struggling to hear the vocal. But a lot of people don't listen to vocals. I mean, I have musician friends and I I I don't I do now, but when I was younger, I didn't always listen to vocals. Me neither. Uh, I mean I am the last one to know the lyrics. Exactly. Exactly. So you're you're on the on the continuum of tone to composition, you're on the tone side, right? composition-minded top-line people go right for the lyric, right? It's a very Western approach. Mm -hmm. I'm like you. I'm more on the tone side. I'm more of like a, uh, like a Sufi approach. You know, there's like the vibe of music and the rhythm of music. That's how the Sufis see it. They don't do harmony, melody. So, yeah, I mean, I've learned and I now really appreciate great vocals. Uh, but when I was younger, no, because I'm like you, like on the tone side. So back to the point. So the vocal needs to kind of uh, feel 
natural. It needs to float. It needs to be intimate. I need to be able to see down the throat of the person or persons. And it, and it needs to you know really hit me in the heart as well as having enough volume for the ear that, that again, I don't have to reach for it. I don't have to try to find that vocal. But if I want to ignore it, I can. Uh, that's the, to me, that's the sweet spot. And that's a, that's a theory I had in mixing. And I do the same now where I, you know, I'm trying to enhance where the mixer has put the vocal. That's very cool. Yeah. Um, well, so, all right, maybe that's why I struggle so much uh, mixing my podcast sometimes because I had my tonsils taken out when I was a kid. No wonder I can't see behind them. Well, there you go. <laughs> all well, right, no, so, you, actually, you can see right behind them. There's, they're, they're not in the way. Um, was there anything else you wanted to share about Lucinda or shall I move on to the next question? Uh, no, I mean, Lucinda's great. Love working on her vocals. You know, vocals are very important to me. That's kind of my vocal theory in terms of the frequency balance, the harmonic distortion component, which is also important. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and again, it varies per style. Mm -hmm. You know, everything is style dependent. There's, there's a recorded history of music that, that whether we know it or not, we sort of have it in our in our heads, we have it in our bodies. So when we hear music, we're immediately, like immediately, one second, two second, we're immediately categorizing and comparing. People can't help but do it. So it's, it's my job to make the categorization and comparison thing work in, without any stress and with a positive result for the for the artist, right? So so I, I wanna put the thing in the right, you know, point of the of the globe and then have it be a, a nice version of that. So the vocals, vocals important always, you know. Um, and I think that the, the, the chain I have is very, um, well, it's, I love my chain. Uh, I, I love it for every style, but it's really good at, at, at doing the vocal thing. Um, a little, you know, a little three and a half or 4K bump with my Fairman EQ uh, where I have, you know, custom tweaked all the tubes in it and all this stuff we could get into if you want to nerd out. But, you know, between that and the sound of my converter, where there's a little bit of a tube harmonic thing with the Pacific Microsonics converter, you know, vocals are easy uh, in my chain. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, I will pivot to that. Um, so I'll jump to a question that comes in from Brian Murphy. Um, he brought up the Fair Mini Q. Um, he had a couple of questions related to that. He said... There's always a controversy over whether plugins can faithfully emulate hardware. How do you feel about the evolution of plugin emulations? If it were to happen, uh, what would your ideal situation, uh, or what would be your ideal situation should a plugin developer ever want to reach out to you to emulate your one of a kind Fairman EQ, which you've customized per band? Um, and then uh, he was also bringing up the idea of of online access to analog stuff like your fair mini cube for example there's a company now i don't know if you're familiar with it access analog they they make analog gear available um just i'm just throwing that all out out at there you at once if you want to just talk about any of those those topics yeah yeah of course um well uh so let's go to the first question Plugins are are great, like like all digital technology. You know, I mean, everyone is sort of uh, there's an innately lazy part of everyone, right? We want shit to be easy, uh, and I don't think of it as lazy. I think of it as effortless. I think effortlessness is a key component in mastery of any craft. And you know, podcasts you, and podcasts, hopefully, and and <laughs> podcasts. It should it should be effortless. There should be a sense of joy and fun. And, you know, if we want to dig ditches and and you know that that's a different life. And uh, I all respect to those people. But there should be an effortless joy to things. So plugins can really help with that. Now, they can also be crippling because it's like too easy. Uh, but we'll skip that. Um, the thing about plugs in terms of what's their approximation, I would say a good plugin, um, and there's a lot of good ones, uh, is in the low 90% range, like 93, 92, 94%. The problem plugins have and that they're always going to have is in two main categories. One is transformer emulation, and the other is high shelf boosting. Um, for reasons we can get into or not, those are two things that analog does so, 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 so much better. Um, but even if we skip those two very tricky things, 
good good plugin is still in the like the low low 90s 92 94%. So in mastering, you know, it's all about the top 1 2 3%. You know, my work competing with someone else and my level is like we're, you know, we're a little bit apart, right? Mm-hmm. My cables are a certain cable because I hear a, like a 1 2% difference from another cable. Uh, my tubes are a little different because I hear a 1 2 3 4% difference. So Mastering is all about these very small increments that you add up to make a big result. You know, it's really a game of inches. Uh, it's like a very boring football game. You know? <laughs> a lot of defense, right? So, um, in in the in the plugin single plugin world, you know, ninety four percent, ninety two. That sounds pretty good. But when you start to combine plugins, let's say you've got five things going on. <clears throat> if you do the math on that. Now you're down in the you know mid 70 low 70 percent range in terms of the combination of the five items, you know like 0.93 times 0.93 times 0.93. So that's not that's not good. That's not good enough. Now mm-hmm. a lot of my colleagues are all in with uh, the plugs and God bless them. You know I come from tone. You know I come from no compromise guitar tone pedals tubes speakers and now mastering equipment so for me like using plugs isn't going to happen if someone came to me like i think it's acoustica they do a good job of modeling Mm -hmm. um i thought about reaching out to them at one point but it's it's, um what ended up happening and and maybe he knows this maybe he's maybe he's leading this question uh i don't i don't remember if i've talked to him about that or maybe he's psychic um so uh (laughs) I've been I've been working with Access Analog for the last year on duplicating my chain like down to the cable and down to the tube. Oh wow. And putting it online. So we are maybe 6 months away from that. Uh middle of the year sometime. And Very so cool. what yeah, so that would be, you know, from the D to A to the A to D, right? I have very specific D to A, very specific A to D, very specific cables, very specific gear. Most of the gear is modified. There's there's certain tube choices, etc. Does duplicate Brian also go by the by Brian? <laughs> right. Right. I I am not unfortunately duplicatable. Uh or fortunately, <laughs> depending on who you talk to. Um yeah, so so that's what's going to happen. So you will be able to rent the whole chain that I use, and not just for mastering. I I I would argue when people use it, they're going to want to use it on just about anything, like right, guitar, cool. drums, any any two bus. Just run some stereo shit through it, and I, I I bet you a lot of money you'll be shocked because there's a there's an enhancement that happens with my chain that was the homework I did in the early 2000s. It was all those years of ABing and combining and and when the thing clicked for me when it was like okay that's that's what I want to hear. That's the balance between this that and the other thing. And I've been using that chain, you know, like I said with one recent addition. But I think when people use this on uh any kind of bus processing, they're going to really love it. That's awesome, man. That's exciting. And and that and that company started out they started out to be fair. It was a little shaky in terms of like the delivery of the product like a year or so ago. You know, they were just like getting going. And and they would they would say that. I'm not shit talking them. They they are my friends and and uh I'm you know, we're we're working together. Well, it's a brilliant concept. I mean, well, I went got, to I went to it. Nam and I walk it around the corner and there's robots going on all this gear and I was like, "What is this? We got to yeah. get a video of this." Yes, you and I are the same. You and I are the same. So, so yeah, they've got they've got the bugs worked out. It's working great. So basically, if people don't know what's going on here, um, analog stuff hooked up with robotics to push the buttons, turn the knobs, and then a graphical interface that looks like a plug-in interface on your computer, which is actually running the hardware. So you turn the knob, the knob turns, and that that is almost instantaneous, even though it's you know, thousands of miles away. And then the audio to and from, depending on your local internet speed is, you know, could be under a half a second, definitely under a second. Um, So basically you'll be able to use my chain running two channels of audio 
any sub mix or any mix, um, you know, we're going to start it at, you know, what I, what I think is cheap, frankly, it's about a $70,000 chain. Wow. And, um, and it's going to be, you know, we want it to be affordable. Um, and if it gets busier, then obviously the press will go up or I'll, I'll build it in another one, but that's way down the line. Um, but yeah, that's kind of, um, that's my exciting technological news tidbit of the, of the, of the week or of the year. Right on, right on. Well, and, you, and you heard and it I, here first, Rockstars, the future. You heard it here first. Yeah. Even if this comes out in, in, <laughs> uh, what, what, when it's going to be April Rome, or whenever. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's still it won't be on the market quite yet, but um, yeah, so it'll be through Access Analog, and, and that that offers some different opportunities as well. I will be teaching one on one mastering classes where people can use my chain, and I'll be using this chain. Amazing, and that's going to be like an intensive one or two day thing. Um, it's not it's not going to be free because my time is money, but it's going to be the best money you can spend compared to all the mastering alternatives out there in terms of a, a mastering education course. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm working on that in my head mostly at the moment, but um, later this year and by the end of the year, we should have that kind of together. And, uh, and then you'll just, you know, be able to use this chain and, um, and, and other things. The, 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 the concept is really cool, you know, hardware in the cloud, basically. Yeah. And, I, and, and just like you, I kind of turned the corner and I was, I just kept staring at it, you know. <laughs> I was like, "What's that?" I, I like that. I don't know why, you know. Yeah. You know, the, just the cool. idea of, of bringing analog, which is innately 1950 or 1930, bringing that into 2021 with robotics and streaming and all that. It's it's a it's an exciting uh, concept. Yeah, and I think that the example that you're describing really clicks with me too because when i first saw it i thought this is really cool but then i also thought yeah but if you've if you got a plug in that kind of does the same thing you know is it, are are people going to go through you know jump through these couple extra hoops necessarily but the i think the answer to that is if you send something and you go through the real stuff and it comes back and you hear that difference that's the that you're sold, you're done, you know, and and what you're yeah. describing it sounds like you're going to clearly hear the difference. Oh yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I I'm I'm good, but a big part of me being good is the chain, right, right. Uh, and and I put together the chain, okay, but I'm just saying the hardware and the and the the enhancement of that, it's a real thing, and and really it's about stacking. It's about stacking hardware. So again, one piece, okay, plug in is good. But when you stack pieces up. Um, and you often are. Uh, that's that's where the that's where the tonal thing really really happens, and and the transformer thing is so important. I mean, a transformer at the end of a mix or at the end of a bus, just the right transformer does things that only a physical transformer can do. And I I don't see that really ever changing with the digital because the complexities of it. Now maybe ever is a long time, but I, I think we're I think we're decades out. Uh, I think we're at a place where plugs are really great, but I think that transformer thing and then the high shelf thing as well. The, the the color of different high shelves is what's indicative of certain EQs, and they're all hard to to, to do digitally. Very cool. Uh, there's a frequency cutoff. There's all sorts of crazy math. It's a bit beyond uh, my pay grade, but um, you know I've talked to people who who do that kind of design work, and that's that's where the that's where the thing kind of comes to a, to a brick wall. Right on. Making sure your vocal sounds amazing in your mix starts with capturing your voice perfectly. This means controlling sibilance and plosives at the mic. Back when I started out, we used to make pop filters out of pantyhose and a wire hanger, but not only did it not look good or smell great, but it also didn't sound all that great either. There's a reason that the Beastie Boys said they never rocked the mic with the pantyhose. Fortunately, pop filters have come a long way in the studio, and Jay-Z Mics brings you the ultimate pop filter, built from solid metal parts that won't break and a flexible gooseneck for easy placement. The Jay-Z pop filter uses is a unique waveguide design that prevents plosives from getting through to the mic while letting important high frequencies through for clarity. Get your vocals just right and use the limited time coupon ROCKSTARS to get 20% off the amazing pop filter at jzmic.com. 
It would be hard to describe in one sentence what gives records a legendary sound, but it would be easy to describe in three letters, API. For more than 50 years, API Audio has created large format consoles for world-class studios. Famous for co-founder Saul Walker's circuit designs and the original 2520 op-amp, the sound of API consoles is the sound of great music. API now brings that legendary sound to your home studio with The Box, a small format console featuring the famous API circuitry that is the perfect analog addition to your digital studio. The box gives you eight recording channels on the left with built-in mic pre's, high-pass filters, direct inputs, and customizable 500 module slots, and 16 summing channels on the right. Or you can mix using all 24 channels, including AUG sends, inserts, and silky smooth faders. API now offers a virtual console experience with a personalized online demo of the box, 16082 or 2448 consoles. Sign up for your demo now at apiaudio.com. Well, let me pivot here and we'll we'll drop in another question. This comes from one of our listeners, Chris Chamness, um, who was very excited about you having worked with Liam Gallagher on Paper Crown. And so, uh, so Chris's question is... Um, that that record sounds so big, um, was that a mastering technique or did the mixes come to you sounding so massive already? I know Oasis was always sounding big and loud. This album was all of that, but a lot cleaner. So I think he did a fantastic job referring to you. Um, and then he also closes, he says, also ask him to get my music in front of Liam so I can open up for on tour when that's possible again. Just kidding. <laughs> Right. Yes. As if I know Liam personally, which I don't. Sorry. Um, well, that's a that's a really uh, flattering observation. And um, so that's a that's a Spike Stent mix. And, you know, Spike's been around a long time. He does does good work. He's got a he's got a method. He gets things pretty damn close um, in the in the case of that record. You know, <laughs> Sort of like I was saying before, music is the combined energy of the people, right? So you're very much hearing Spike's mixes. I mean, you know, the mixes are mixes are huge, right? Mm -hmm. But the thing that he's the the part of his comment that was sort of the the latter part, where it's the I forget what he said, but the that sounded like my part in it. Um, so you know, the there's there's movement in the air that wasn't there there's low end air movement and then there's just tweaking the brightness so that it's bright but it's not abrasive again hot girl at the bar right if you're if you're going to go out and you're going to wear you know a bright orange outfit it still has to be sexy so if if a if a if a thing is going to be slammed with compression and pushed and have a lot of high end content or high mid content it still has to be attractive. It has to be alluring. It has to be magnetic. It has to be something that, as a listener, draws me closer to the music. And again, this is the this is the kind of the idea of confident mastering, or or really giving stature to the artist, which is um, sort of a phrase I haven't used, but that's how I think of it too. My, my goal is to give every artist stature. Um, from from the tonal kind of uh, you know the the frequency balance the, the distortion balance the transient to compression balance and again the mid side power balance so you know that's a huge part of that is spike of course uh, most of it is the artist of course uh, but but he's hearing what I did as well which was you know something if you listen to a bunch of my records you, you you'll hear a thread there's a theme there right on well um, Chris is an artist I've been producing. For a little while too, so uh, don't be surprised if one of our records comes your way after that answer. Oh, that's great! Well, I, no, I love, I love to, hear you. I'd love, <laughs> right on, love, right on. Um, okay, so here's another question from Brian Murphy. Uh, Brian says, "What are some key differences in mixes you receive between an underground artist or a major artist, such as Depeche Mode, Green Day, Black Keys, or Marilyn Manson? What do you notice most that differs between some of the best mixers to some of those that have yet to achieve such a level of mixing status?" That's a tougher one to answer because, to be honest, you know, mixers are getting better all the time. I'm very pleased 
with the elevation of the craft. Um, I, I think I think a show like this and all the other things online, uh, people are getting better. Mm-hmm. So you know what I noticed isn't necessarily. I mean, yes, there there are there are a few mixers I work with that have kind of a much more of a sonic imprint than others. Um, and, and that's a kind of a short list. Then there's a few mixers I've worked for who are very famous and very high end people. And that's a list. But then there's a lot of people that, that you've never heard of who are sending great mixes. And the difference there is just, it's just the material, you know, it's, it's maybe not the most, um, compelling piece of music as compared to someone who's internationally successful. Um, so from that standpoint, I'm not really helping his question very much. Uh, what, what, what I, what I would say to kind of answer it in a sideways way that might help somewhat is it's not necessarily about that, but the question is really what makes a good mix? Uh, in, in my opinion, Mm -hmm. If, if, if that's the question, um, we can we can start to look at that. It's a, it's still a very difficult question, but but I don't think it's really about the people who are huge versus the people who are just getting started because that's I think that's um, that's a trickier thing. But you know what makes a great mix? Firstly, is that it has a, a, a vision, or you might say an attitude. It has a singularity. A great mix is not trying to please the bass player and the tambourine player. It's trying to present the artist. In particular, it's trying to present this one song, this one particular statement from this artist. And and you can call that what you want. You can say attitude, you can say vision, you can say clarity, you can whatever words work for you. But it's it's you know, when 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 I was younger, I'm going in the way, way back machine, you know, the mixes, the mixes that people did for me when I was first learning the craft from people, and and I won't name names, of course, but the thing I heard early on, which I still hear to some extent, is is two things. One, it's like trying to please everybody, and two, it's trying to be sort of technically perfect, as if there is such a thing as a as a perfect mix. Right, right. So those those two things just don't make sense. So the, the mix is ultimately um presenting a human being it's presenting a human being's opinion or idea that we call a song organized with verse chorus bridge what have you in in terms of you know pop music um so presenting that thing has to do with what it has to do with well knowing the arena you're in what's the basic genre that you're in and what, what are the expectations of that genre and then it's it's doing things like i said before it's having clarity in the vocal that's right and in the moving the low end and all that and then it's having excitement from the verse to the chorus it's it's looking at mixing as a composition mm-hmm. you know mixing is literally in my language the composition of fader's pants compression distortion mixing is its own composition it needs to evolve a mix needs to evolve in the same way you know, with with crescendo and and you know you know rise rise and fall, it needs to have the ebb and flow, the 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 the, the movement of a of a classical composition, uh, of any composition, right? Because the, the mix itself is its own little art form. So a good mix does those things where the mix kind of has its own attitude. Um, uh, sorry, the the artist has a clear attitude and statement where I, I really hear the artist and what they're saying in the song, which is the primary thing. And then the, 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 and part of the way the mix gets there is by sort of evolving in a compositional way. Yeah. The way the way that, you know, a mix can. A mix can start in the center. It can go to the sides in the chorus. It can do something here. It can do something there. It has to, um, you know, a, a great mix does what I call, you know, like growing up there was the, the little bouncing ball on the bottom of the screen that oh, did yeah. the, you know, Wow, was that like schoolhouse rock or something? So a, a great mix has a bouncing ball. There's always something top line to listen to. It the, it may not be the vocal because the vocal you don't sing the whole time, but from the moment it starts till the moment it ends, you're literally pointing the listener to where to go in terms of a primary, 
Yeah, it's a guided tour, kind of. It's a guided tour. And then under that, this other thing is evolving, which has an emotional ebb and flow and does things that, you know, classical music does or that sex does or that, you know, a, a Picasso does. You know, you, you do these sort of artistic, emotional movements underneath while you're pointing at what to check out. So if someone just passes by, if they're just looking over their shoulder as the car drives by, they see the car. If someone listens to the song without really listening, they can just follow that bouncing ball. But if they listen again, there's more things to discover and the mix evolves and grows. And all of that represents the clarity of the, of the artist and the clarity of the song. So you don't have to make all your mixes the same. In other words, they shouldn't be. Right. It's, it's my job in mastering to make them work together. It's your job in mixing to make each mix interesting. So when we start thinking about balancing our mixes with each other, failure of an idea, don't do it. When we start thinking about making our mix loud enough, failure of an idea, don't do it. Make the mix move dynamically for the style and the artist. That's very it. Very cool, very cool. And I, and I know what you mean because I think of it as uh, one of the struggles of mixing is going through that period where you make everything into a perfect gray. You know, you try and make sure you can hear everything. Everything gets equal billing. And then yeah. you end up with mush and it doesn't do anything. Yeah. As, as I like to say, um, democracy doesn't work in mixing. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's benevolent dictatorship. You nice. know? There, there has to be like a benevolent dictator. There has to be a clarity. You know? that, that's why you hire one mixer over another. And this is the trick of people getting started mixing is that you're working with, well, maybe not today, but it used to be in the band era. You'd be working with a, a team of people in the room, and you're trying to make everybody happy. Right. And, and that innately would fail. You give them all a fader. Yeah. <laughs> give them all a fader with nothing attached, right? <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's benevolent dictatorship. It's not democracy. Um, it's now, the evolution. at the it's, risk of, of uh, getting to uh, putting on my science lab coat too much, what about some of the things that people feel like they struggle with in that department, like where you're like, I don't know if I'm getting my low end right or anything like that? Are there any basic tips you want to share for that? Or is it, again, just like for dumb question? No, no, no. For the well, feeling. No, no, no dumb questions for stars. But no, so, so low end is hard, right? Low end is one of the hardest things to get right. The main reason is the room you're in probably sucks. So the best thing anyone can do is base trap the shit out of their mixing space. Um, bass traps can never be too many. Nice. You can't, and, and every corner in a room is a corner. So the triangular corners where three walls come together, those are most important. But every other corner where two surfaces hit at 90 degrees, that's a corner. So, you know, you got to trap, 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 trap your room. Yeah, that's, pe people make great bass traps too, don't they? Oh, they do. They absolutely do. And and you can you know, kind of make them yourself. You can get some fluffy 703 or 705. You can put up a frame and some burlap, you know. But yeah, you, you, you can never go wrong buying bass traps because you'll have them for the rest of your life. And you can never go wrong bass trapping every possible space in your room. It should look ugly. Your wife or girlfriend or mom should come over and sneer at it. It should look weird because all of those corners are 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 interfering with your ability to hear what's coming out of the speaker. So the room is huge. Then, of course, the speakers we use, you know, they're generally not very flat in the bottom. And, and they're just, you know, you've got ports and all kinds of weird issues. So low end is a, low end is a trick. So the, the good way to deal with low end besides, you know, prolific bass trapping, the, the trick to that is um, a pair of like Oratones or Aventones. Um, which I recommend for mixers over NS10s, which really require to be, you, you need to learn on those from someone who knows. So the, the Oratone, Aventone, I mean, we're talking under a thousand bucks a pair, I think. They're yeah. six, seven hundred bucks powered, you know, you can get them with a little Class D amp, or you can get an unpowered pair, which I would probably do, and some little MOSFET Hafler, you know, at the corner shop for 200 bucks. Some little, uh, you know, I like MOSFET solid state, it's kind of fake tube. But it doesn't matter. You can do the Class D powered ones. So the beauty of those is they're like, you know, 100 hertz to 14K or something. And it really defeats the room. It defeats any crossovers. It's just, it keeps things in a singularity. 
I mean, my, my giant speakers here, which are like, you know, you know, pushing six figures, they do the same thing, meaning have a, a singularity, but they do it in a full range way. So to have a sound come out like it's a like it's a whole sound where you don't have distinction between drivers, you don't have crossovers, you don't have port, you don't hear any of that stuff. To do that in full range takes a lot of money. To do it in, you know, 100 hertz to 14K takes 600 bucks. So the Aventone, uh, Oratone, I think is back in business, but like the Aventone is a great way to go. So I, I completely agree with you. And I, and I have a, a Vontone or Aventone mix cube just to my right. And I only have one intentionally because I always mix in it uh, in mono when I go through it. Uh, and I like turning it down really low and just making balanced decisions. I find that's really helpful. Adam Audio designs monitors with a mission to bring accuracy, transparency, and high definition to your studio, guiding you each step of the way on your journey from starting out in a home studio to installing your ultimate mixing setup in your pro studio. Check out their complete line of speakers and headphones, from the T-Series to the AX Series to their top-of-the-line S-Series, which all use the unique ART accelerated ribbon tweeter design, famous for creating smooth, detailed imaging that lets your speakers disappear Appear into your music. Want to feel awesome to make brilliantly accurate creative decisions in your mixes because you can finally hear your music clearly? Your ears are the greatest instrument you have, and if you can hear the music, then you can mix the music. Learn how to set up your studio monitors and control room for great sound, plus lots of other cool studio tips at adam-audio.com education. You know, mastering is a guilty pleasure. It's been phenomenal to hear a client tell me that the master wasn't just perfect, but it was right. It connected. I love assisting with the mixing process by giving free feedback, just because, you know, if the mix feels some positive impact from my input, frankly, it'll be easier to master. At least 50% of the mastering is preparing the mix. If the mix is really good, most of the mastering is already done. It's much more of a conversation now from end to end. It shouldn't be a black art that's hidden behind closed doors. Shouldn't be a one-shot deal either. Even after the master is delivered, we can still work on it. We can even go back and make mix changes later and update the master for a fraction of the cost. That's the iterative master. I'm Brian Murphy of Sound Porter Mastering. Let's talk about how I can help elevate your mix into the best master possible. Contact me and get free feedback on your mix or a free master demo at soundporter.com. Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Rockstars of Drums will show you how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a Nashville session drummer and a Grammy-winning studio. Want to start mastering your own records? Rockstars of Mastering walks you through exactly how I mastered my own record using nothing but plugins in PreSona Studio One. Want to learn how to create a mix that doesn't suck but rocks instead? At Mix Master Bundle, I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins so that you can have punchy, powerful drums drums, guitars that rock, bass you can feel, and a mix that is in your face. Plus, it's totally free as my way of saying thanks for listening. Then go to MixMasterBundle.com to get started for free now and look for the clickable link in the show notes below. But so let me extend that question about uh, your room treatment. So this again comes from Brian Murphy. Um, and he's talking about your listening room being unique and that you've got absorption around the listening area. Um, but he says the lower frequencies extend beyond that enclosed space. And he said, would you mind explaining what really works for your low end in your room? Um, and did it take you a long to find a great balance of frequency response that works for you? Well, in this room, it took me three months of planning and one day of installing, and then I was working. Um, it was all about the planning. But I, I've built all my own rooms. This is my third room that I built. So these aren't purpose-built rooms. These are just moving into a house. Okay. I'm, I'm sort of the master of these low-cost things. In, in this room, I have probably uh, $20,000 in treatments, which compared to my peers who have $150,000 or $200,000 rooms is a, is a deal, right? Yeah. Um, so what I have is a, um, a whole lot of uh, real traps, uh, six inch walls that kind of stack, stacking blocks. And I have them spaced off a wall by six inches because every time you have a base trap parallel on a wall, you can, you can gap it by the thickness of the trap and double the efficiency. Mm -hmm. 
So I've got those all the way around, eight feet tall. I've got mega traps from real traps in the corners. In the ceiling, I've got um, RPG skylines for diffusion, which is 3D diffusion, meaning it comes in from 3Ds, it goes out from 3Ds. It's, it's, it's all, di- all dimensions in and out. And, uh, and then I've got some absorption in the ceiling as well for first reflection points. I've got side first reflection point killers where the tweeter first hits the wall. You want to absorb mm-hmm. at the first reflection point. Uh, it's nice to be like four by four foot there, absorption. And, and then behind me, I've got one dimensional diffusion where the sound comes in and, the, and then it goes up and down. It, it comes in straight, it goes up and down. So that's 1D diffusion. So that makes a small space seem bigger. So my space is really decked out with, with traps and treatments, but it wouldn't work. I mean, and it sounds amazing, but it wouldn't work at all if it was actually this size. So the size of this room is only 12 and a half by 15 and a half. It's a very small room. What makes my room work for, for, for my purposes, I mean, if this was a mixed room, yeah, you'd be, you'd be fine. But for my purposes, you know, to, to do high level mastering, it would never work because it's just the physics aren't there. There's not enough space in the room to trap the low end. So what works here is that my, my room is sitting on the ground floor of like a three story open floor plan space. So the low end in my room is going out into the larger space. It's kind of like if you if you set up in nature, you know, you're out in the middle of the woods or you set up in a big warehouse and you just set up in the middle of the warehouse and if you treated all the walls around you, if you made if you made yourself a room out of this real trap stuff. Mm-hmm. It's all treatments everywhere. What ends up happening is the low end goes through those treatments and just goes out into the space. So really the the ideal acoustic space, I mean, and, and we know this phenomenon, right? Because you're next to the guy who's got the sub blasting and it goes through his car, right? Right. So low end goes through metal, it goes through concrete, it goes through all kinds of stuff. So the low end here is escaping out into the building. So my room is yeah, small looking, um, but that works for me because I like working in like a seven-ish foot triangle. But the space of the that the low end is going into is the huge space. So that's what makes this space work uh, for, for, for mastering purposes. Cool. That reminds me of um, advice I remember hearing from Carl Tatz, a studio designer once, pointing out that a lot of times people will build a room that they're going to put their studio in, like I did, and instinctively say, oh, we're going to do double sheets of drywall and make it really rigid to stop sound going through, um, which can be a detriment to the sound of a room because if you do a single sheet of drywall and it, it will actually let some of the lows escape the room, like you're describing, um, just sort of, just, just roughly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that topic. yeah, we all have our theories on that. If, if it was, if it was, well, if it was my room, I would go double drywall with green glue because I don't like the sound of drywall vibrating. It's like four or 500 Hertz. Interesting. But I would go double double wall with green glue. I'd kill it. But then if it's a home situation, just put a door in the corner. Like if you've got a door in the back corner, and I was consulting an old friend on the phone just yesterday. I haven't talked to him for 10 years and he's building a little room and and it's a tiny little space. It's 11 by 11 by eight and a half. It's a nightmare, right? It's got 11 by 11 is a nightmare. Right. And... <clears throat> If that's not clear, I can explain. The <laughs> no, no, we've talked about the, you don't okay. want a cube. Okay, yeah. We don't or square, want a, anyway. Cube bad, square bad, yeah. Um, yeah, you want some ideal ratios. There's a bunch of them. But he had two doors in his back corners, and I was like, great, just leave them open. So, you know, that that's what I would do. But again, you know, Carl's a pro. He's got his ideas. But yes, you, you, you need the low end to have a place to go. Mm-hmm. If you can't trap it. Uh, I mean, purpose-built mastering rooms are are big enough, and they've got huge, you know, three and four foot areas and all that, and that's a fine way to go too, uh, to trap. I'm I'm just using the whole building, yeah. So I'm 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 like you know I'm like set up in the middle of a warehouse, you know. Well, that's yeah. another thing. Um, two two thoughts on that. One is it's how Steve Albini describes electrical audio because there's a basement space underneath the control room and the tracking rooms. And they intentionally ported the edges of the room 
so that the room extends in its volume down into the subspace underneath um, to, you know, extend the low frequency. And um, and I think about, you know, we're familiar with seeing a speaker having a port to ex- to improve the low end. I might be getting the physics of it a little bit. I might be butchering the physics of it by describing it, but I imagine a room is similar. Yeah, I mean, low end, uh, that's interesting about Albini's place. Um, I didn't know that. Um, yeah, Studio A. Yeah, it's an interesting anecdote. My old studio, yeah, well, two studios ago, uh, I guess this is version four kind of thing, but, but two studios ago, I was in um, uh, Columbus, Ohio, where I'm from, but I was a little bit north in Delaware, Ohio, in a farmhouse, like 1850s farmhouse. So it had a dirt cellar, unfinished dirt cellar, and it had original uh, plank flooring with no subfloor. So over the years, there were gaps that developed in the floor. And so I used that to advantage. I mean, my walls were solid, solid concrete with, you know, I don't know what was going on there, but the walls were solid. But the sound could be trapped in the room, and then it was going through the floorboards into the cellar, much like Albini's space. I didn't know that story. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the th- the thing with low end is it it, it goes to corners, um, mostly, but it just it it stays in the room unless you trap it or you vent it out. So, yeah. so you got to do one or the other. Yeah. Very cool. Um, okay, here's another one from Brian. Uh, do you ever reference the artist's previous work, or do you go into the session with fresh ears? Um, I think that's a twofold question. I think that might be if it's a new artist, but maybe that's also relevant to an artist that you did a previous record with and then now you're doing a new record? Yeah, I mean, it just depends. Um, usually, like m- the massive majority, I just sit down and work. The The only referencing I check is I have my own like 12 references that I've had for 25 years that I just know really well. And then I have some of my past work uh, that's <clears throat> some of the better known work that people might, be thinking of when they hire me or, you know, these are things that just help me make sure my head's in the right place. Um, And I've got those in my session kind of always. So if I sit down, I might check my own stuff or those 12, excuse me, 12 refs that are other people's stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, Then those 12 refs are uh, an interesting thing. I, I, I recommend everyone would do that. Let me, let me explain the concept of the, of the, let's say 12 refs. So, a production ref, if you're a mixer, uh, if you're if you're a producer, if you're an artist, a production ref is a target. It's like I like the sound of that snare, I like the sound of that bass, I like the sound of that vocal. Those are targets. A mastering ref is about the fence. It's about the edges. It's about what's acceptable on the extreme, and if I know what's acceptable on the edge, if I've got a fence, then I can play in the field. Right. Nice. So, so a mastering ref is a totally different concept. So my mastering refs cover stylistic ground and also sonic ground. So I've got like you know the most low end ever, which is uh, from uh, in, you know maybe it's not now because now we have uh, Billie Eilish, but uh, <laughs> but that's it's it's too distorted for me. I can't I can't use that as a ref, but. Um, uh, I use uh, Bjork Homogenic. Um, oh, which, great. Wow. Actually, something Spike mix, I think. Yeah, yeah. And then, I, you know, I use, I mean, I'm not going to go down my refs because let me just stop right there because uh, I don't want people to copy my refs. It won't help you. What you have to think about is this. What's a song that you really think is well done that has big low end? What's a song you think is really well done that has very thin low end? What's a song you think is really done that has a bright vocal? And it's a little sibilant. What's a song you think is really well done that has a kind of darker muted vocal? What's a song you think that's really done that has a scooped curve? You know, kind of a lot of like low and high scoop, mm-hmm. mid scoop. What's a song you think is really done that's like very mid rangey, like a uh, you know Snoop Dogg from the '90s or something? What's a song you think is really well done that is pushing the volume like really far but still works, moves enough air, doesn't sound shitty? What's a song that's dynamic but still kind of plays, you know, in 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 the in the in the present moment? So, coming up with some extremes of of different qualities, um, and having those as your refs—that's a that's a fence, and you can learn that fence 
and you can take it with you wherever you go. And that's what I've done. I've had it for 25 years. I've had these same 12 songs. That's cool. Uh, it's so, cool to hear you talk about like fences. I, it also sounds like cardinal directions, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, the thing is you want to be free to play. It's very different from in production where you're trying to go for targets, right? So you're, you're, you're free to play when you know that you're on the field, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, so that's what I recommend people do from, um, from that standpoint, I mean, you can have your target refs, but from a mastering standpoint, you want to have, you want to create some, some edges, some fence and, and, and some extreme opposites of, of a, of a given quality, bright, dark, loud, dynamic, sibilant, not sibilant, you know, super compressed, not compressed, what, whatever qualities you think of come up with two versions of that and have those there. So you can start to see in your head what I see, which is kind of a three-dimensional sphere, if you will. Like I, I think of the recorded history of music as a sphere. So there's 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 axes to the sphere. There's there's an EQ axis. There's a transient axis. There's a uh, the volume axis. There's a there's a mid side thing. There's there's different elements that that make this world, which is like everything that's ever been recorded, right? Yeah. yeah. So then we're trying to take a song, we're trying to put a record into that sphere in the right place. And by right place, I mean it's familiar, but it but it has a freshness. You know, that, that's what works for people. It needs to be familiar, but fresh. That's the, that's the balance. You know, uh, obscure things that are experimental are very creative, but if people don't have a reference, they're not going to get it. And something that's overly familiar, we would call that trite and boring. We're like, oh, I've heard that 20 times. Mm -hmm. There's a balance between something that has um, a place in history and also has a uniqueness in the moment. And, and the, the, the fence of, of refs gives you kind of a sonic version of that. Okay, here's another one from Brian who asks, uh, when a new client reaches out to have you master their album or singles, do you have any routine preparation advice for the mixes? Or do you prefer to accept and try to master what's there, even if it's totally cooked? Yeah, so I I, I do. Um, I've, I've, I rephrase it over the years. I'm not sure what it is now. I have a virtual assistant running now. So if someone comes for a quote, they sort of go through it. And it, it says uh, something like this off the top of my head. Um, make the mixes the best you can make them in every way without worrying about the volume. So if you want to reference material that's in your general genre, do that by lowering the volume of that master material to suit and send me mixes that have all the processing, except if a limiter was added to make it hot for the client. So, so I want fully processed mixes that are done with the monitor volume turned up that are brave and bold and that are, you know, only looking at things from the standpoint of the mix, not the world, not the volume, you know, just, just what's, what's the best mix on its own terms. Okay. So when you say without the limiter that was added for the client, what if we're adding the limiter for ourselves? Yeah. If the limiter is part of the mix, then leave it in. Okay. I'm saying if a limiter is added at the end for volume only, then I would take it off. And I would, I actually want people to send me both because I want to hear what the expectation is based on the hot ref. Mm -hmm. And then I don't want to work from that, probably. I mean, I might, but I probably won't. It just depends. So that's encouraging because it sort of says, it gives us uh, permission and lets us relax too, because the struggle can be, um, I push the limit on something. I feel like maybe I should take it off before I give it to mastering, hand it off to the mastering. But when I take it off, I don't know if I like my mix as much that would be an indicator for us, right? If we don't like our mix anymore, then it was then we're removing something that was helpful. Yeah, I mean, I, I basically say, you know, make the mix with whatever tools you need. If there's a limiter involved, do it. A lot of people mix with limiters these days, and and you can do it very well. But you don't have to use the limiter as a volume tool. You l use the limiter as an extreme compressor, you know, as a, as a limiter, as a clipper. So, so. If whatever you're using in terms of tools is in the interest of the mix, great. If you're acting out of fear and you're trying to be loud. <laughs> we already know the answer to that one, right? <laughs> we've already covered that. 
right? <laughs> so so if if the limiter throws on at the end to make the thing that you liked when you had the monitor turned up louder, well, I want to hear that because that's now what you're used to listening to. But but yes, to your point, it does give you freedom because you shouldn't be trying to master when you're mixing. It's a different step for a reason. Different people have done it for decades for a reason. It used to be tracking was an engineer and mixing was an engineer and mastering was an engineer and producer was a person, right? So you're talking about four people with 20 years of experience. You're talking about 80 years of experience. And now I got this computer with some plugins and I'm going to do all that. I'm going to use them. Tricky. It's a tricky thing to do. (laughs) All right, I got a, I got an acronym to help um, the rock stars remember your your fear analogy. So, um, fucking expect a rejection. There you go. <laughs> don't step fear. Stay away from it. <laughs> yeah, we don't we don't like fear. No one wants to hear that. Everybody's insecure. Everybody's afraid. We don't want to trigger that. We want to elevate the people. <laughs> elevate the people. Wait, was that your REM record that didn't get released? Right. Yeah. <laughs> That, that was it. Do you feel like the time you've spent watching YouTube videos, trying out mix tricks, and tweaking version after version of your mixes has gotten you nowhere? Have you been looking for a simple, straightforward, step-by-step process for creating a pro mix that won't take years to learn? What if you could have a Grammy-winning mix engineer who understood all your mixing struggles and could coach you through them? If you struggle with any of these questions, then the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass is just for you. Now you can discover a proven step-by-step mix system from Grammy-winning mixer Craig Allen. Alvin for consistently creating a pro quality mix from your home studio that will sound amazing everywhere. When you're ready to take your mixes to Grammy winning quality, then get started at ultimatemixingmasterclass.com. Got to wrap up here. Um, Let me hit you with one more from Brian. Uh, What's your typical delivery format for clients, big name and underground? Uh, Delivery format. Um, like I work. Yeah, I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you interpret that. (laughs) Okay. Uh, I deliver 24 bit 44 one wave files. Okay. What do you think would be, why would there be a distinction between uh, a big name or an underground? Would it be, is it because, is it that an assumption that a, that a major label is going to ask for all sorts of things? Is that maybe where the question's going? I I mean, I don't, I don't know where he's coming from. I mean, the, uh, The, the the more interesting question really or kind of where he's headed if I could take it there is is thinking about uh is kind of a pet peeve of mine this notion of high definition equaling a high sample rate mm-hmm. um and that's not a real thing so w- let me talk about that for a second so okay. if you if you buy a two hundred dollar converter at guitar center and it does 96k or Heck, it might do 192 today. I don't know. Uh, are they still in business? I'm not sure. But um, like they're in like the fourth bankruptcy. But um, the idea there that that $200 converter that's doing 96 or 192 would give a better result than my converter at 44.1 is kind of absurd. I mean, my converter is class A, discrete, hand tested by people for three years, it was $25,000 in 2000. If my converter was made today, the owner of the company said it would be 70,000. Wow. And that's a two channel A to D and D to A. And I don't even use the D to A. I use Bricasti M1 uh, SE, the special edition Bricasti. But, you know, so I'm printing at 441. Well, if you know the math on 441, it gets well above human hearing. So the, the issue of high definition is just 24 bits. Everything else is marketing. It's somebody trying to sell you something, either the label or all, all the other people who are trying to do these different things. And, and, it, and I would include, um, uh, I would include an, an anti-plug, if that's a term. I think I just made that up. I'm going to anti-plug MQA for a second. MQA is total bullshit. Um, what is it, it? What is MQA? MQA is sold as a 16-bit 44.1 or 48K file that is a reduced a file from 96 or 192 that is correcting the flaws of PCM. 
That's, it keeps me up all night, every night, man, thinking about that. I, I, you're going to have to break this down for us. <laughs> right. You're like, damn, my, my, my PCM converter, I just, there's something wrong with it. My brain just hurt a little bit. Yeah. So uh, what MQA is, in my opinion, is um, a company called Meridian that used to make a lot of money on high quality DVD players. Really good audio, really good video. And and what happened? Well, Netflix happened, right? Streaming, streaming video happened. So Meridian's out of business. So these guys got into this MQA game. And what they're trying to do is get every song ever made and ever made in the future to pay them a licensing fee to go through this MQA process. And then they're going to the D to A manufacturers and trying to get them on board so that everybody has to buy a new D to A so that a little blue light comes on that says it's MQA audio. So what MQA is, is master quality authenticated, which means the mastering engineer sat down in the session and went through their process. And so when you're listening, you're listening to what the mastering engineer heard. It's a nice idea, except in order to create a market, they are bulk processing millions of songs. Wow. So mastering engineers aren't authenticating anything. On top of that, it's kind of a bogus idea because what they're doing is just messing with the filters at the top end. And so it creates a little harmonic distortion, and I can't test it because I don't have equipment, but my my ears, which are my trusted equipment, tell me that it's like a... 0.05 dB louder. It's like a tiny bit louder. So then the audiophile world gets a hold of it and they listen and they hear a little harmonic distortion. They hear a little volume. And what does that sound like to a lot of people? Uh, better. Louder better. is better. Louder is better and a little harmonic distortion, particularly if you're listening to like, you know, 80s stuff like uh, Dire Straits or, you know, The Police or something that was made sort of very clinically back when early digital was quite clinical. Mm hmm. So a little distortion sounds a little more modern. A little volume always sounds good. So there's all kinds of bullshit here. They've also gotten a patent that it's lossless, which is not possible if it's fixing anything. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> so we're fixing something, but we're not changing anything. Okay. And they got a patent on that. <clears throat> They're running about a 50 or 60 million pound debt. It's a br British company. And uh, I, between you and me, and uh, just you and me, of course, I hope they die. I think this is evil. I think this is people who are just trying to make a buck off something that's fucking up music because they're they're bulk processing my work and everyone else's work that's been approved by clients, it's been approved by labels, it's been approved by the production team, and they're bulk processing. And the name of the thing is Master Quality Authenticated, meaning that it's done one song at a time mm. by a mastering engineer. So it, there's like lie on top of lie on top of lie. It's like it's like Trump started an audio company and he's very convincing. He's like a very soft-spoken British guy. He's very he seems so humble and it's bullshit. He's a con artist. All right. Well, it's so, a good thing you don't have any strong feelings about it. Right. So there's my <laughs> there's my rant for MQA. But back to but back to sample rate. Sample rate isn't a thing either. But if you have a cheaper converter, what you'll find is that a higher sample rate will give you um, at times, a better sound. Now, if you have a great sample, if you have a great converter, the sample rate doesn't mean a darn thing. And I've talked to the builders of, of converters, uh, everyone from Metric Halo to Dave Hill at Crane Song and people like that. It, it, it doesn't matter. What, what sample rate does is it alters the presentation from kind of a low-end density up to a high-end details. So the higher sample rates can be very useful if you're recording and then working in the box. And that's an absolute truth. But in terms of being better quality because the sample rate is higher, that's that's not a real thing. Okay. Thing. So if I'm recording at 96 in Pro Tools through my uh, one HD1982 interfaces, that might be a place where I would hear a, a quality that I'm liking and, and it's okay to move forward like that. But, well, of course. I mean, yeah. I mean, if it, if it if it sounds good, it is good, right? right, right, right. Uh, I'm saying in terms of my world, in terms of delivery formats, there's this whole like high definition concept, and I'm just saying high definition is 24 bits, and I'm saying that the the greatest version of a master that anyone can purchase and that anyone can hear is the 24 bit or 16 bit in some cases. I mean, Daniel Lenoir did a lot of records to DAT tape. That sound amazing, and they're all they're all sixteen bit. Yeah. 
They just won't play back anymore. <laughs> well, I mean, master, a master for iTunes won't take them because they're not 24-bit source material, oh. which, again, don't get me started on that. That's more m- malarkey. But um, so the, the, the actual sample and bit rate of the mastering session, that's the best. There is no you know, gilding that lily. Right, there is no right. fixing it in PCM. There is no making it high def by taking it to 96K. You you can't you can't do that. You can't increase the definition of something. Yes, you yeah. can't increase the definition. You you can only tell people and 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 what does that make people do? Ah, they fear. What do they fear? They fear of missing out. It's a FOMO thing. So here's here's an analogy, Rockstars, that I think you would understand. You probably get the idea that if if you take something down to an MP3 and then try and bring it back, take that MP3 and turn it back into a wave, it doesn't once an MP3, always an MP3. It's a that's kind of a bad analogy because I'm I'm describing something maybe negative, but in your well, case, the 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 top quality yeah. is when you're done mastering it and you can't you can't do something else to it unless you remaster yeah, it, is, it, I guess. it is what it is, right? So so in my world, you know, let's say it's a major artist. Let's say there are 10 people listening. Let's say we go through two, three rounds of revisions. Let's say that one song is really tricky. It gets remixed. And then I do three more. So let's say we do we do all of this. Let's say it's a big mess, tricky thing. All kinds of work goes into it. The degree of difference between me and the other mastering engineer they didn't hire, well, that wasn't very big. But they hired me. Okay, then the degree of difference between my versions one, two, and three, it wasn't very big, but it was audible. And, and, and on and on and on and on. So the degree of refinement that's happening in this material is pretty extreme. And then someone comes in and is going to be like, oh, we're going to change it, and it's going to be better. And you just have to scratch your head and say, why are you rude? Oh, right, because you're greedy and manipulative, and you're lying to people, right? Because that's what's happening. Wow. So the mastering product is the best audiophile version ever. Groovy. Awesome. Well, thank you for breaking that down. Um, we are out of time, and I've got a closing question for you. This one is hypothetical. We can take the Wayback Studio Machine, and you go back and find young Brian Lucy. Uh, maybe you're swapping out tubes on your guitar amp looking for the ultimate tone, and you say, listen, dude, I know you. one day you want to be in the studio making records. Here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. What advice would you go back and give yourself early in the journey if you could? My intuition says this is not the first time you've asked this question. No, no. But it's the first time I put tubes in a guitar amp. <laughs> okay. You sort of altered the question. Yeah, I just I riff on it there. Yeah, you're riffing. Sure, of course. Um, wow. So, again, what's the one thing I would tell my young self? Is that the question? Yeah. What advice would you give yourself if you could? Um, well... In my case, or for general public, because there's a difference. Like if if you if you want me to give advice to young people, or what would I really have told myself? It's which two different. Which things. would you like to answer? Um, I'll do them both. So what I wish I would have told myself is uh, trust the process and trust yourself. Mm-hmm. And I guess that's probably the same advice for anyone else. <laughs> I it's, think it's, it's good advice. I, it's probably the advice I'd give myself too. Yeah, trust the process because it, it it is a process. What we do is a thousand little steps, and and what we do a, a, as an evolving, passionate person, or if it becomes a career. Uh, I mean, I never intended uh, for this to be my career, but it was just a passion that I had as an mm-hmm. artist. But what what we do as a passion, or what we do as a career which is the word that everyone is so obsessed with today. Um, yeah, it's a process. And nothing happens quickly, so you have to trust the process. And 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 while you're doing that, you just have to trust yourself. Um, there is only one you, and the way that you see things matters. And Or hear things. <laughs> yes, that's right. See slash hear, sorry. Um, so yeah, trust the process, trust yourself, and um, and I guess I'd add a third thing, which is be a servant, not a slave. Nice. And and 
and I add that because that's always been my mindset. Um, so I'll say that for the public, the public benefit, like it, it's always service, you know, but it's never, it should never, you shouldn't get lost in the process. Like you're as an individual, you have a value. So people work with you, um, and they're working with you. They're not working with someone else. And, uh, and maybe you're telling yourself, well, they worked with me because my price was less or whatever. It doesn't matter. That's not the way to think about it. They're working with you. You have a value. And and music making is a team sport. So when there's a healthy collaboration, then, then the product is better. You know, when, when everybody collaborates in their correct role, you know, um, the product is better because we are the test market. You know, we are the collective test market for the thing and if we stay you know you know in a service mindset but we don't let ourselves get sort of pushed around um you know we we, we stay with uh, i don't know what the word is if it's identity or um you know our, our individuality you know mm -hmm. individuality matters you know and we still have to serve uh but there's there's a balance there to be struck you know so you trust the process trust yourself Always be a servant, but never be a, you know, in servitude. Yeah. yeah, don't lose yourself in the process. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Be a servant and not not in servitude. I think that's I think that's the good advice. That's great, man. Well, uh, Brian, thank you so much for being on Recording Studio Rockstars with us. And and incredible of you to take out all this time for us. Really appreciate it. Can you let the Rockstars know how they can find you online? Where would you like them to go check out your music? And what if they need to get their next hit record mastered? Sure. Well, I am at magicgardenmastering.com and uh, partial credits list is on all music, of course. And uh, if you go to the Magic Garden Mastering page and scroll to the bottom, there's a little get a quote. You can click on that and you'll talk to my virtual assistant and um, right you can also email me or you can give me a call. And those are all, both the email and the phone number on the on the website. And Rockstar is a reminder that we've got uh, Brian's a playlist, Spotify, in the show notes. Just click through and listen to that and hear how great these records sound. They really sound awesome, dude. I really enjoyed listening to your... I'm going to continue listening after the interview. Well, I, I appreciate that very much, and it's been a pleasure. Yeah, thanks so much, man. Look forward to meeting you in person, and I um, hope you have a great rest of your night. Okay, you too. All Take right, care. Man. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com and if you want more free content from recording studio rockstars all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email again that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email and i'll keep you in the loop with articles videos podcast updates and even free gear giveaways for your studio just look for the link in the show notes below thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a rock star i'm lid shaw and this is recording studio rockstars now go make Make great music. Recording Studio Rockstars would like to give a big thank you to our amazing sponsors who helped make this episode possible. Sound Porter Mastering, OWC, Adam Audio, API Audio, Spectra 1964, Isotope, and Jay-Z Microphones. Remember to get your free mastering demo at soundporter.com and use the coupon code ROCK10 at Isotope for 10% off any plug-in purchase or start your seven-day free subscription trial to get access to lots of their plugins. And use the coupon code ROCKSTARS at jzmike.com for 20% off this very pop filter you're hearing right now for a limited time. You will find links to all these wonderful sponsors in our show notes. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio. They're going to help you make your best record ever. I would also like to thank our fantastic team here at Recording Studio Rockstars. Vlad Wesselchenko, Braden Stremming, Hugh McDonald, and John Richardson for additional podcast and video production. You guys rock. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.